very pleased to welcome one of Burgundy's hottest young vignerons, uh, unfortunately much, much younger than me, uh, Charles Lachaud from Von Romane. Hi, Charles. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. And uh, how, how's the weather in, uh, in Von Romane at the moment? You I hope see. it's better than here. <laughs> It's uh, sunny. It's full sunshine. It's not too warm. It's good, but it's quite sunny. Yeah. yeah. Actually, how? Just a good question to start off with. Actually, how, how's the 2020 vintage? Because we're sort of talking about, you know, viruses and everything, <laughs> but nature keeps going. So, uh, how's how's 2020 so far in in Burgundy? In the, in the Very good. It's a shame we had this very virus worldwide. But the good thing for us is that we had no testing, no visitors, nobody. <laughs> so we were really able to focus on the work in the vineyards. Yeah. So nothing else, just the true, the basis of our job, just vines, vines, vines. And uh, that's- No, no journalists right. coming to your door. No journalists, no wine amateurs. So we're able to provide a better work for them when uh, they will return. Yeah. And how, how's the- How's the weather been so far? Has it? You said it's sunny today. How was? How, how's the uh, flowering been? And everything? for the moment, the season is very nice. It's very early. It's one of the earliest we have ever seen. I've heard uh, it yeah. but started very, yeah, very, very early. And the weather is nice. We had uh, enough rain from time to time. Enough sun. It's not too warm. Uh, I think the vineyards have not looked uh, recently so good. They are not stressed. <laughs> So, you know, this is pressure. Uh, the harvest, the yield, uh, the crop looks great compared to what I look for. It looks fine. So, so it, for the moment, it looks nice. We still have two months or a bit more before harvest, but it looks perfectly fine for the moment. When, do you have an idea uh, when harvest might be? Are you looking at another early September or? Maybe a bit before. Um, yeah, late August. Yeah, if the weather doesn't turn to coldness, uh, we might start end of August. Yeah. yeah. And is that, the... is that becoming like a normal for you now to start in, in that, that time or? I hope it's not getting normal, but we are unfortunately getting used to it. I know. Yeah. So yeah. But we'll see. It's not the, the best. Uh, but we do what we can with what nature gives us. So this will be the case again this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as usual, I think what we'll do is uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the history of the domain and your family and then yourself, because uh, you've got a, you're a very principled winemaker uh, and your wines are very, for me, very interesting to taste because of your, the way you approach the, the vineyard. So I'd like to talk about that as well. Um, as usual, uh, people watching this, if you'd like to ask a question, we've already had uh, one question come in. So if you'd like to ask a question, it's easier if you ask them at the beginning of the interview so that I can uh, ask the question, question to Charles as we, as, we, uh, as we chat over the next hour or so. So let's just sort of start a little bit with the, the history of the domain. Can you sort of, how did your uh, family uh, come to Burgundy? Uh, for, we are established here since a long time. Uh, the estate started in 1858, exactly. Um, and I'm the sixth uh, generation. So it was not as large as many of us. Uh, it increased uh, years after years with the different uh, buying and um, weddings as well, uh, when the people had some, uh, some land. And now we cover 14 hectares, a little bit less, in 15 different appellations. Uh, from New Saint Georges to Gevray Chambertin, we have one vineyard which my parents bought in 2007 in Gevray Chambertin. Which one was that? La Tricière Chambertin. La Tricière, yeah. yeah. Just a small vineyard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not I mean, one. was it like when with your kind of ancestors? Was it a very uh, small holdings, and then gradually you bought small parcels here and there yes. over time? Yeah, my parents have acquired, for example, almost three hectares uh, over the past uh, generation. Like Chambol, we didn't add any Chambol village before. Uh, no, maybe, yeah, between three and four hectares. My grandfather bought some vineyards himself. Uh, 
like the Roman et Saint-Vivant, uh, Claude et Corvé Paget, this kind of uh, important appellation for us. And some have been, has been in the family for a long time, like the Von Roman et Premier Cru, les Grands Suchots, or this kind of appellation. We have it since uh, generations and generations. But it got bigger and bigger year after years. And yeah. we'll see what we can do, but it's getting a bit more tough now to, to try yeah. to expand. And a yeah. bit, it's a bit uh, expensive. And where is your, just for people who haven't been there, where is your winery based? Uh, well, so we are based in uh, Von Romane. It's uh, the heart of uh, our appellation portfolio. And after we have ex extended to some places next to it, like New Saint-Georges and Chambol, and this vineyard in uh, Gevray, this Latricia. But we are very close to, to the domain in general. Yeah. And you're actually, your winery is actually on the main road, isn't it? The RN74. Yes. Yes, yeah. the entrance of Norman. Everything is here. Yeah, it's uh, an old school estate in the way it's family run business. Uh, we don't have any investors or anything. It's still a family owned domain. Yeah. Uh, I, my mother is in charge of um, all the office work and the allocation. And I'm in charge of all the technical. Uh, my father was with us. He left in October to leave me more room. And uh, so it's managed this way. We have a vineyard manager, but that's it. So it's we are the size where it's at the limit uh, to need more uh, responsible people. We are still able to manage everything by ourselves. But yeah. it's great days with 14 hectares. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how did you just tell me a little bit about yourself? I mean, uh, it's, it's I think maybe I've told you before. I mean, uh, your domain was one of the very first domains I visited, I think maybe on my first trip long before I was writing in the in the 90s and I think I I saw your your father back then what was your own path into of course you're as you say you're the sixth generation did you always think I'm going to be a winemaker or did you ever think no I want to do something else I was not thinking to become a winemaker at all uh, but I had no idea of what I would want it to become like many young people know that and about the vineyards, I always loved wine, but my parents always told me since I'm very little that to be a good, a good uh, winemaker, you have to be first a vine grower. And you know, the vineyard work um, is not very trendy. It's tough. You're under the rain, under the, the snow, under the sunshine. Sometimes it's too much, sometimes it's windy. Some days are great, but it's tough and physical. So mm. I was not very attracted by this. But when I was, sorry. Did you ever see your father working out in the vineyard and think there's no way I'm going to be spending the whole day in the cold and the rain? I'm going to <laughs> that work was in a nice warm office. <laughs> that <laughs> was exactly it. Yeah. And, uh, when I was 16, I spent my, you know, it's the longest holidays you have as a student. You have three months. Mm -hmm. And it's the age you uh, can legally work in France and have a pay, paycheck. So I spent the uh, whole summer in the vineyards. And after a week, uh, I was completely fond of it. So I uh, subscribed to the viticultural, viticultural school and it's how it got started. Yeah. And uh, yeah. now I don't will to spend time in the cellar or much abroad. Uh, I want to be in the vineyards for the place where I didn't want it to be first uh, first spot. So, so when, you, when, when you did that first week in the vineyard, did that change your I idea about becoming a winemaker when you actually started you know, making yeah. one. Yeah, I quit a normal school to go to viticultural school. I knew it was what I, I wanted to do from, from this point. Yeah, yeah. I think that the uh, worst after. And when you when you were young, I mean, obviously, you come from a winemaking family. Were there any uh, memorable bottles you remember you drank with your family when you were younger and you thought uh, you understood what wine was about? It's more when there were some people over and uh, the parents make you try some wines telling you it's special. I remember some old wines from uh, the Romani Conti, these kind of, uh, of things. Uh, my parents never, my family never had a really large cellar, a big collection. Uh, mm -hmm. They were quite humble wine amateurs, uh, but they got from some, even sometimes some special bottles like this, which I had the, the luck to try at this time. So now it's my aim to build myself more of a collection or a cellar to I'm, I'm already starting to share with my kids. My daughter is young, she's two, year, two years and a half, but she already smells and have a drop of everything we, we drink to start to, 
to see her taste if she likes it or not to develop her taste. And it's <laughs> if, if it's like me, what I found is uh, when the children are very young, they're kind of fascinated about the, like you say, the smells and the, the grapes growing on the vine. And then they become teenagers and wine is terrible and it's because they're rebelling against their parents. And then when they're a little bit older, they, they come back into sort of, oh, maybe it's quite a nice job. And uh, so just, just warning you. I think they love the ceremony about removing the cap, taking it, putting out the cork, preparing the glass where there's something special, a special moment coming up. So it's, it's nice. Yeah. I remember for, 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 for my children, it's, di it's different for yours, but I remember they saw the bunches on the vine for the first time. They always see it in the supermarket, but they never saw it growing on the vine. So that was sort of uh, kind of uh, an amazing thing for them to see. But um, so like uh, you went to after that, so you, you, you sort of caught the wine bug and then you started learning about wine and studying wine. Uh, did you go to the University of Dijon or? I don't know, only viticultural school of Bonn. And then yeah. I've traveled uh, during almost three years uh, to work in uh, the vineyards and in the, the cellars of different estates in Burgundy and abroad. And I was doing between those internship, I was working at the family domain to pay my next uh, plane ticket. Can you give me some of those names that you worked at, either in Burgundy or abroad? In Burgundy, I worked at uh, Domain Toulobo, and uh, my last internship was at uh, Armand Rousseau. And uh, I've been to New Zealand, I've been to South Africa, and twice to Oregon, uh, for example, to the Drouin family estate. And was that always doing, were you always focused on uh, Burgundy grape varieties, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay? Did you ever work somewhere where you could work with Syrah or Cabernet? Uh, I did like in New Zealand and in uh, South Africa because they have plenty of varietals. But I yeah. wanted, and my parents wanted me to, to work in places where there is some Pinot and Chardonnay to already get an idea of what was happening, where we are and elsewhere to have a better understanding. Yeah. If you could work with a third grape variety, not Aligote, but if you could work with a third grape variety, what would you like to, uh, what would you like to make? I don't work with Chardonnay already, but oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm quite fan of, uh, it would be maybe Syrah or Grenache, because there's yeah. some of my favorite wines beside uh, the, I like the single variety wines. I'm not much of the, of blend wines. I like when it's from one. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that's logical. Be being in Burgundy, you're very focused on that one variety making making the wine, whereas in Bordeaux, it's the blending is a much more important part of the process, I guess. Which can make really great wines, but for the way I work, I like to keep things uh, simple, if we can say. Uh, I like fastidious work in the vineyards or this kind of thing, but blending and it's a science which doesn't interest me much. For me, it's what's happening outside. The less we can do at the domain or in the cellar, uh, the better I feel. Yeah. And can you just tell me the, the transition from your, your father to yourself? So when did you start working at the domain? So I joined the family domain in uh, October 2011 after, the, wine, after the, the harvest and the vintage, which I did in July. And it was my first year going all around from uh, winter pruning growing season. And so the 12 vintage was really my first one at the domain. And we started with a small change, um, introducing all cluster, uh, because mm. there was none before in the wines of my uh, family. And yeah. the wines which gave me the best emotions I had were all made with all bunch in Burgundy or in the Rhone Valley. Is that the reason why you introduced? Was was it you that intro, was it you that introduced whole no. cluster to the domain, or your yes. father had some? We started because I, I wanted to to try to do so. And we in 12, so it was in 12, and we were supposed to do only one tank. And after a few hours of harvest, uh, my father told me, try whatever you want. I was thinking I was going to be shy. So we had all cluster in the 15 appellations from 30% to one cuvee from the beginning with 100% the Regno, because it was the smallest. But the yeah. rest was maximum 50%. It was 30 to 50, 60, and there was one cuvee at 100. 
and it got worse later on. <laughs> but was your, was your, and like you've sort of mentioned it, but was your father accepting that you wanted to use uh, uh, stems? Because as you said, he, he never used stems at all when he was running the domain. No, was there never. one vintage where he experimented or? He experimented once or twice on his Negos label, uh, but that was it, never on the domain. And like this, it was to start to make a transition in terms of style. And my grandfather before him uh, gave him a lot of uh, freedom when he came to the estate. So my parents, they like did the same with me when I arrived. I think it's the, with what is happening now with the domain, uh, the biggest look I had is really the distrust from my parents to, we are going under dramatic changes uh, compared to what I was doing. And it's because they trust me and it's, uh, it's the biggest luck I have. Yeah. We've got the bad things. We are able to do this on some nice operations as well, which is not bad either. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have a, if, if your, if your parents have a different idea to you, do they uh, let you know? Do they say, okay, Charles, maybe you should do it a different way or do they give you complete, is there any, is there discussion or do you, do you call the shots every time? No, no, uh, they, they, they were really never much discussion. Sometimes they could have got worried about one or two things. Yeah. Uh, like in the mostly about viticulture, some dramatic changes like the no trimming and stuff. But they were never arg to argue or anything. Everything was more, was very easy to, to do, to pass on. I, think yeah. I started to really want to change things from. 14, 15, and uh, they really let me go on from the very beginning. Yeah. So quite, uh, quite easy. Yeah. Um, I had just, uh, one question came in. We're just talking about uh, whole clusters there. So uh, William Lawson asked, uh, so uh, do you, the percentage of stems you use now, is that 100% across the whole range or does it vary depending on the cuvee? Uh, for the moment, it's 100%. At the beginning, it was depending on the cuvee and um, the vintage. Mm. But now with the practices that we have in the vineyard, the aim is to have the best grape possible. Like this, I don't have to take care about if I do all cluster or not. Because uh, it's really something I like and I would love to be able to do it like 100% every year. But for that, you need the perfect ingredient. Yeah, yeah. So would you use, I mean, uh... Uh, William's question was sort of saying, so would you use 100% both in a hot growing season and a cooler growing season, or would you change it slightly? Uh, I wouldn't change much now. Yesterday I had a cool uh, vintage, 2013 Renew, which was 100%, and it suits it perfectly. And uh, we had uh, the same thing, a Renew 15, on a warm vintage, and it suits it. I think if it's small crop with a good balance, healthy, after it depends how you work on it. All cluster is just a way you bring the grape in. After there is thousands of ways to handle it and it results in very uh, various ways, various tastes. Yeah, yeah. Let's just for a moment, I just want to go back a little bit. We'll come back to whole cluster in a minute. I'd like to just, just like you've, you introduced a completely different uh, way of, in both in the vineyard and the winemaking to, to your father in many respects. So in the vineyard, can you tell me what techniques you have introduced and why you introduced them? Uh, a lot, and we are still going on. Uh, this year is a major year of changes with the team. We've done a lot, a lot. I'm going to soon, when the season ends, do a small recap on the internet. Uh, the first uh, strong one was to take down the, the soil work. Uh, we kept doing it, but slighter. Then we moved to Guyot Poussard almost five years ago now. But this year we've quit Guyot Poussard to move to a gobelet, but a special kind of gobelet. It's not the classic gobelet. Uh, we've developed it with the vineyard, vineyard manager who's up, who happens to, to be named Charles and has exactly the same age than me. All <laughs> oh, right, okay. The same, uh, same aims. Is that so the rule to... if you work at the domain? You have to Sorry? be called Charles. You have to be called Charles and be the same age to. 
Yeah, and he has uh, the same uh, new haircut. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah. we have we have a pruning which is between Goblet and Guillaume Poussard. We are developing it, and uh, we might try to put a brevet on it soon uh, because it's special. We adapted several techniques together, and we make some rules. When the bud is this way or the wood this way, you have to prune it like this. Or it's quite complicated, but it's a major change. Uh, this year, we have increased all the palissage. In uh, four months, we've taken up all the post to one meter sixty. With so an extra you've raised, raised the yeah, level of the... one meter to one meter sixty. Yeah. As in the minutes, everybody has left is a seasonal worker since a week or ten days. I have mine for another month. We are 28 yeah. in the field, and uh, we are removing all the laterals under the top under the, uh, until the apex. The vineyards are not trimmed 100%, and yeah. some will be old, some are not. Some this afternoon were 3 meter 40. Something like so it's this. a bit like the, the vineyard ends up to look a bit like a jungle. I've got a picture of you here that you kindly sent to me with the sort of shows really well. The sort of you let the tendrils just grow and then you kind of fold them in. So tuck them in. And this one is arched. Yeah. So to be arched, uh, you we don't see the apex, the, the top of the branch, but this one yeah. was about meter 20, from meter 30. And this, so we try to arch them. But this year, the aim is to, with the new wires, they're a bit higher than the ones on the photo. They are almost close to my chill or my nose. There are some minutes we will try not to arch at all. Just keep them straight, like three meters and a wall of, uh, of leaves. So where, where does, so you had said three meters, so it's going three meters where, in which direction, like? Uh, Great, we, we, are, we are many to try to go fast in the vineyards, to go several times around the domain to keep the vineyards uh, straighter we can, to be able to, to work nice, to have a good ventilation, good air coming in and sun, like this to, to fight against the disease naturally, mm. to use the Mexican copper and sulfur. Yeah, because that 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 can be a, a problem, can't it? If you're if you're allowing the 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 tendrils to really grow, uh, do you find that uh, it impacts? You have less air circulation and more risk of 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 rot. Is, is have you found that to be a problem? It's a pre-received idea, because when you do trim, um, the buds on the branch are very close to each other from like this distance. When you don't trim, the buds between them on the branch are of this distance. So you have more, you think you have more vegetation, but the leaves are way further from each other. So there is more space for the air and the sun. So you have less humidity and you are more resistant to the disease. The vineyard which has not pruned has a better self-defense against disease. So it's more healthy, but it's way harder to manage because it's less work by tractor or with machine. It's all done by hand and uh, it's tough. It's very tough. Yeah. I mean, so. we should explain why, why do you not trim the vines and keep them neat and tidy? Um, for What's several reasons. Reason? Well, we don't trim because the vine grows by its extremities. So when you don't trim, you see the branches going up. But at the same time, the roots are getting deeper and deeper from year to year. So they fetch more fine elements to, to feed, uh, to eat. Uh, they have a better resistance to hydric stress, which is something quite interesting at the moment. Um, as the stem is an extension of the branch and turns to wood, the stem gets longer as well. So you have a natural antibotrylase. It makes leaking, more leaking. So you have... Um, more mirandage, it makes a smaller crop, which is interesting to me because I aim for 25 hectoliters per hectare, not the 50 we have the legal right to produce. I aim for half of what we can produce, but I want to get there naturally. No green harvest, nothing like this. So we prune short, we prune late, uh, we don't feed much the soil, we try to let it be on itself. Uh, we let the vineyard grow, the more we can to give a good health to the vine and help her produce a small quantity of grape, but with a good balance and concentration. Yeah. And is this, uh, I mean, we should mention like uh, 
uh, Lalubi's Loa has been, uh, an, I'm sure, an influence on, on you. I mean, she, she, I think maybe she was one of the first winemakers to uh, allow the vines to, to grow because it's amazing when you, you, you can easily find Lalu's parcel because it's the one with all the, it, look, it kind of looks messy in a way, but... Uh, they, but they were uh, two, almost at the same moment. It was uh, her and uh, Jean-Yves Bizot. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It became quite example for, for that, the wines that strike me. So we have this similar way of letting it grow, but we all have a different way of working. We don't prune the same way. We don't let it grow to the same way. We don't have the same palissage. We don't work the soil the same way. After everybody thinks it's similar because we, the three of us, we have long vines, tall vines, but the only similar aspect uh, between the three of us. But it was an inspiration. Yeah, the ones was the ones that strike me the most, and it was the two only people growing vineyards this way in Burgundy. So I was like, if I want at some point my wines to strike somebody as much, maybe I have to start to go in this direction. Mm. Mm. I started that in the Reno from 2015 or uh, 14. Yeah, yeah. So does does that mean like? Uh, is there much exchange between yourself and Lalu and Bizo between if you're doing something different? Does, does Lalu, because a lot of winemaking is about trying something, seeing what the results are, and then kind of, you know, you have to do it to find out if something works. So does, does Lalu sort of come to you and say, Charles, I'm interested in what you're doing here? And, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Bonjour. <laughs> so yeah, I have the luck to be, I won't say close, but to to discuss with the two of them, but not at the same time, differently. Um, what's different? With her, we don't speak about techniques, but more about passion. And with Jean, we we share a lot about what we do. We have almost no secret because we have the yeah. same in the same aim, same goal. I was wondering if Lalou's taken one of your techniques and used it at Domain Loire. I don't know, maybe, but what was funny, once she was in the cellar, she told me about the post she was going to change. And I told her, I started last year in the Renault. And she was like, oh, I'm going to have a look before to, to do it. So yeah. uh, I don't know, but it's, it was funny to do something before or for once. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, when you have a, a model, somebody who inspires you that much, mm. it's great to be able to have them and show them the way you work and how you, you think as well. Yeah. And to, be, to be able to do that with her while, she, while she's still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to I just ask about in the, in the vineyard is um, you don't automatically replace the vine. You try and cut out the, the any dead wood or infected wood is it cur curatage? Uh, can you just explain a little bit about that? Yeah, it's something I discovered uh, with a great friend Olivier Lamy at the Domaine Hubert Lamy in Saint Thomas. Yeah, and uh, it's with a small saw uh, you cure the dead wood in the vines. You remove what's dead in the vine to to give more space to what's alive in the vine. I've not done it since a year because we had too many other changes going on. But uh, with two or three of the members of the team, we will restart from this uh, winter. And the aim would be to do to go around all the domain within six years. But it's tough. I did a vignette completely like the Vonormanet Les Grands Suchot. Mm. It's 0 0.6 hectares. Uh, it took me and an intern who helped me at the end uh, 36 days in total of work. So you do that all yourself? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because at the time I didn't have enough uh, concerned or skilled people. It's something which is not hard to do, but you have to be really passionate and focused when you do it to, to be precise. And I did not have this kind of people in the team before. When now uh, all the team is this way, so they all want to, to do curtage, for example. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Is it, um, do you have... <laughs> It's okay, don't worry. Is it, is it something like you find, like, obviously you're, you're very, very 
you know, I mean, people say all the time, I'm very passionate about my vines. But in my experience, like uh, I've met very few winemakers as dedicated as you as in, 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 in the vineyard. Is it, is it difficult for you to sort of uh, almost trust somebody to do like, like Curatage in the vineyard? Is it, do you feel you have to do something yourself or? It was when I knew the people were not interested enough. No, it's not anymore. I really have a strong team surrounding me. Uh, yeah, including my, my mother and uh, in the team I have, they can go. I will go with them for the first day or to to show them, because there are some uh, kind of techniques you acquire with the time. So if I can explain them from the beginning, they will win some hours of uh, of work and uh, of pain, because you're always bended on your knees or sometimes you are laying down to cure the the bottom of a vine, and uh, but it requires a lot of implication and passion. If mm. you don't. You won't do it correctly, and so you won't cure the disease. Yeah. But it's it, when you've spent days doing that, when you look at the vine, you really know where are the sap flow, what is the great one, what is could be the sick one, or whatever. It's after you know your vines by heart, just by color or <clears> whatever. So you said you've done that for sorry six years. Did you say six vintages? Uh, I started how long ago now? <coughs> I've not done any for the past year because I was too busy. Uh, but I've done a lot during yet two years and a half. I started four years ago, I think. No. Does it become easier as you as you go along? Like you instinctively know yeah, <clears throat> which part of right? I need to cut that part out. Yeah, you sometimes you, just by your look, you know where you you have to put your saw or your small mm -hmm. um, ciseau à bois. Uh, it's something uh, like a pencil to to sharpen the wood because sometimes yeah. the saw is too. So you go by hand. Yeah, yeah. And can you just sort of just staying in the vineyard? Just go through briefly the, 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 the vineyards that you have at the domain. I'll bring up a map here. You can be sent. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so we have so 50 vineyards in total, uh, but 15 appellations. Um, yeah, we have a, a Bourgogne Pinot Fin, which is a mix of uh, se, uh, seven vineyards, three at the bottom of Chambol. Uh, you yeah. can see it on the far right of this map. Uh, two between Nuit and Vaudormanet. And uh, two on the Promo Princess side, south of Nuit Saint Georges. Then we have three villages Nuit, uh, which is a combination of eight vineyards, Vaughan village, uh, three vineyards, and uh, Chambol village, who's on the top of the slope and is about eight vineyards as well. And then we have two Ludi village one is in Vaughan Romanée, uh, Les Mézières, one in Nuit Saint Georges, which is uh, Les Poisets. Uh, we have five Premier Crus. Two in New Saint George, Les Procès and Clos des Corvées Paget, three in Vaughan, uh, Les Chaumes, Les Grands Suchots and Aurigno, and to finish four Grand Crus, which are Claude Vougeot, Quartier de Mario, Echezot Les Rouges, La Tricière Chambertin, and Romanet Saint Vivant. And one, one thing that's, um, you're not the only person that does it, but <clears throat> not many do. You're very specific about using the exact, uh, let's say, part of the vineyard. On your your label, so you, for example, you don't just say uh, les souchots, do you? Uh, we say les grands souchots. Les grands souchots, yeah, yeah. Because it's not part of the souchot, uh, we do, but not for everybody. Whereas you would have fifty wines. Yeah. It would be unbearable, even for people like you when you come to taste. You wouldn't yeah. want to try fifty wines, and for some most humble wines like Bourgogne and villages, sometimes they are better blended. It brings together more complexity. There are always some better vineyards, some which are not uh, as great, but together they create something different, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you a really difficult question, so I will apologize in advance. If you had, uh, let's say, uh, they passed a law and you can only have one village crew, one premier crew, and one grand crew, which ones would you choose from your... We, we would blend everything like in Bordeaux. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need stuff for a village. Hmm. Uh, don't know between uh, maybe Nuit Poise. Because I love the Vaud Mézières. Yeah. But Poise is Nuit. And as the people never expect much from Nuit, I like to surprise them with this wine. Yeah. 
Um, as a priority, I, it would be Corvée Paget or Renio. If I have to pick only one, it would be Renio because it's too small and it's why it started everything. And it's not a bad appellation at all. Yeah. And the Grand Cru, mm, La Tricière Chambertin. Over Romilly Saint Vivant. I think it's more, it's not easy, La Tricière Chambertin. It's something cerebral, it's complex, it's lacy, it's not a, a wine you can introduce everybody to. When Saint Vivant is more understandable, like I would say for the people. Yeah. I find I, I, it's interesting you say that. I find uh, Latricia Chambertin, yeah, in some ways is the most difficult to understand. It's for me, it's always a little bit more austere than, you know, Chambertin or Claude de Bez or Ch Chapeau Chambertin. It's it's never a sort of um, sensual wine. It's always a little bit sort of conservative and. But I, I find ages extremely well, Latricia. So, and Latricia, what's your parcel there? Is it, how old are your vines generally? I mean, uh, you've got some very old vines. We have quite old vines in general because um, my family never uprooted a uh, wall vineyard. We have yeah. always been doing repiquage. So every year after harvest, we go replace the dead vine. So the average is uh, 50, 55 years old. And the eldest are approaching the hundreds. Which um, where where is your oldest finds? Uh, there are some in Corvée Paget, uh, Nuit les Procès as well, uh, Suchot, Regno, Saint Vivant. Yeah. And Nuit les Chaux as well. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to make sure, obviously, that you've got new vines coming in because you don't want to be left with all really old vines. Is that true? Yes, and no, because now with our practices, with the pruning, the no trimming, uh, some very old vineyards, which we were thinking were starting to get um, weak, are not. I think mm. it's just we, did, we didn't have the right viticulture for the old vines. Now they're really getting back to life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can you just run me through the, uh, how you approach the harvest as well? When, what, how do you decide what day to pick? Uh, by testing the berries and that's almost it and the color of the, the seeds. I don't look at uh, sugar level or acidity. It's not something I do really care about. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you ever analyze them as you go through the winemaking process or you just do yeah, through taste? Yeah. There is a reason to force you to do at least one analyze of a few grapes before picking. So yeah. we do it in case of control. Um, but that, in the way I do wine, it's pointless. Uh, because if you do it based on analysis like pH and sugar, uh, sometimes you can have the right maturity on the paper, but the grapes are not, or the opposite. Yeah. The grapes can be ripe, but not on the paper. They can like sugar and uh, acidity, but they will be phen phenolically ripe. So yeah. we're trying much about it yeah yeah and because we have a small crop about with our 25 hectoliter specter they get ripe quite fast we don't have 50 60 hectoliter specter with vineyard stream at one meter so like 60 centimeters of leaves for 50 hectoliters of uh, per hectare we have almost two meter three meters of leaves for 25 hect of uh, hectoliters per hectare so the photosynthesis which is making the vineyard get ripe is huge it's really huge yeah. so so it's, it's, it's quicker than if in a regular vineyard, then the, 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 the sugar accumulation. Yeah, Is that's something we've observed since we work this way. Uh, we harvest earlier than we would do if you would trim uh, classically at one meter 20, one meter 30. And so also you've got to be very precise on the day that you pick, I guess, as well. Yeah, as well. But because we go a lot uh, around all the vineyards in the summer. I think since pruning, we've gone to each vineyard only to do manual work, yeah. minimum of 10 times. Mm. Since yeah. Uh, yeah, February, March, uh, 10, 12 times. Yeah. So there is an order in the season with the growing, the flowering, which you know, and uh, it's 
very often uh, the one which applies for the for the ripeness as well. Yeah, yeah. Because of the amount of rain, of sun, and everything. Yeah, and then just like uh, just to go into a little bit more detail about using the the whole bunches and the stems. How do you uh, how do you approach that? I mean. Um, do you build up like a it's like a, a mil, milfoy in the in the barrel or what's your approach? Uh, as we use almost hundred percent everywhere now, uh, we don't do milfoy. We just put yeah. everything, everything goes in. in. Uh, but before we did put a little bit of uh, this stem at the bottom to be yeah. able to have some juice to do pump overs. Yeah. That's only, uh, yeah. No, yeah. no, we don't have this program anymore. Everything is hundred percent all cluster, so it make, makes it much easier in a way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no uh, question to 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 wonder about when you put your grapes in the tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can you just go through like your approach in uh, in the winery as well? Because you you have you have a new winery, don't you? Or it was built. Um, um, my parents got it built uh, in the early two thousand. It was the first vintage in it was two thousand and five. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and uh, so it's quite useful because they spent they carry in an old vineyard where they always refurbished, did some work. So when you do something really new, you know what you certainly don't want to work with, which uh, contraint uh, the height of the ceiling or this kind of stuff. So the winery we have is very practical, and uh, it's full of tools we are able to not use, like there right. was a a tool to punch down, which I sold uh, last year. And uh, instead, we got some, um, how you say English? Some holes to put ropes to do all our punch down by feet and be, uh, have something, somebody with a rope to assure you, like rope climbing or this kind of thing. Like a so pulley. In the winery. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, my winemaking approach is very based, like in the vineyards, on the empirism. Um, yeah. We taste and smell the, each tank several times a day. And depending on that, we decide if we do punch down or pump over, but uh, no more than one work a tank per day. And some days we don't touch the tanks. There's minimum one or two days in the process where we don't touch the tanks. And now our process is from picking to press. Uh, the longest batting time is 11 days. And in 19, it was uh, 10 days. Right. And the protest was six days and a half for a third of the estate. Wow. Wow. In some ways, it's not even the time of cold soak. For us, it's the entire process. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like completely opposite of how some Burgundy wine makers were approaching their wines in the 90s, isn't it? Like uh, doing a big yeah. extended maceration. Before the difference between Côte de Nuit and Côte de Beaune uh, from harvest, everybody in the same village was starting within the same week. There was mm -hmm. one week between the coast. No, I start at the same time when some people in the white wines or in the reds in the Côte de Bonne. But within the village of Vaughan, for example, we can have one month between the first and the last to go. There are yeah. some growers who has, have not started to pick when I have finished to press everything since two years. Yeah. But it's really nice because it goes with the, the approach in the vineyards. We all have different approach. So we have different uh, ripening. So it's good. We have so much difference in the, the date of picking. Yeah. Is there much like uh, I was saying to you before we started transmitting? Like we've we've actually been really lucky. We've had like uh, I think four winemakers from Von Romane doing a Venice live. Is there like um, much communication between the winemakers? Because whenever I go to Von Romane, there's nobody there apart from a few tourists taking photos of the cross with Romney Conti or something. But uh, it always seems very 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 quiet and the. When I speak to the winemakers, um, maybe certainly the older winemakers seem to be quite private and um, maybe that's different for, for younger winemakers, I don't know, but is that is that true? In French we say, les habitudes, on la peau, on la peau dure. It's good to, it's hard to, to change a good habit. No, it's, I think the people are competing in villages like where we are. When the Norman is 260 hectares, there is room for everybody on the market. But the people are competing. It's more easy to discuss with a wine grower in the US, in Italy, or in New Zealand than in your own village. I have more friends with who I talk about techniques all around the coast of, uh, of Burgundy, 
or in France or abroad than within the village. There are a few, certainly with who we, do, we discuss a lot. There is Jean-Yves Bizot and uh, Pascal Munuret from Gérard Munuret. Yeah. With who we talk a lot about uh, our approach or um, Michel Malard at Eugénie. There are a few, but it's not the, the common trend. And that would be yeah. I, th I think it's almost something very specific to Von Romanet. In some ways, it's the most um, famous village because of the history uh, of the vineyards. Yeah, but whenever, like, even when I go to say Chambord Musini, you know, I get the idea that people go around for dinner or meet up from time to time and taste each other's wines. But when I go to the Von Romanet, even like next door neighbors, it's like they could be in different countries or something. And, it's 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 quite strange to me because you, you meet you know, more often your neighbor when you go abroad for a testing van during the year. It's something we all say. It's funny we we meet more when we go abroad. Yeah, yeah. Depending. I wanted to ask. I wanted to ask you too. Like, uh, what's your typical day? Say at the moment, what did you do today, for example? Uh, today we are removing the laterals in the vineyards with the team to keep them straight. So what, what uh, time do you start work, for example? This because week, you start at, uh, I go down at seven. The team is arriving at quarter past seven to be in the vineyard at half past seven. Uh, we come back for a small lunch and we we back at one until uh, quarter past five. But last week was different. It was very warm. So we started at uh, five in the morning to finish around uh, half past 12. Yeah. But, um, yeah. The day is, normally, I don't have a routine. I do have more now with the COVID, uh, no visitors. And I've taken the luck to decline every testing request until next autumn to really stay in the vineyard with the team and uh, keep pushing the work we, we're trying to do with them. Yeah. So you've used it as an opportunity really just to focus on the vines and the vineyard without yes. any you know, interruptions. So. And, it, and also, talking about COVID for us, it, that it will be hard to see people coming back to the estate in the autumn. Is that, is that a warning? Yet. <laughs> I want to be yeah. out in the you'll, you'll say to me, oh, you have to come at five o'clock in the morning or something like that. So. No, no, no. We'll have to, to see people. I know it goes with the job now, but yeah. I don't love too much to be out and take care of, uh, of our vines with the team. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, I had one, one question come in uh, um, from Les Affair. Can you explain the, the reason for the uh, new label and the range of wines? Um, yes. Um, the label, my parents uh, did. I, I haven't took a new bottle. Uh, I, well, the label we add with the brown orange uh, stripe was too modern and uh, we have techniques which are not really modern. I think I'm a modernist. I try a lot of to apply and use a lot of things from the past, but in a modern way. And uh, my parents uh, let me change everything at the domain, except uh, the look of the bottles, which is not the right. important. But now I wanted to have something uh, which is in line with our practices and approach. And I wanted the, as there were so many changes and the people wonder a lot about what we do, I want them now that when they will see the, the 2018 on the market next autumn, because we have not sold or shipped any yet, I want them to understand the philosophy when they look at the label. Uh, it has to be striking, but simple, uh, not modern, not traditional, with a nice interpretality. Mm -hmm. And it's my wife who did it, and it was the Cahier des Charges she had, which, is, which was not easy, but uh, she quite succeeded, and uh, I like it. And yeah. the crest, the old blue, is the what we had on our bottles in the 50s, 60s, but the typos are different, the size of the label, several things. So it's mixing past and, and new things, so yeah. which what we do in the vineyard and in the cellar. Yeah, just a little retro, I guess, when I yeah. see the labels, but I like it. It's good. I, we did have, I want to, a couple of people asked this question, uh, which is, is, is a good one. They were asking, we've had a couple of people, uh, for example, Sid Cross, asking about the high density plantings. What's That's your, 
because that's obviously something from a high density I know from uh, Domain Lemmy, you know. Uh, I, it's because of you. Uh, I have only one vineyard at the moment. Yeah. Uh, this new plantation we did in Renio, uh, it will be three years this year. I had yeah. 17,000 vines there. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. It's very interesting. And for me, when the people wonder about the result, it's uh, do you a favor, buy your identity white from Lamy, try his normal one next to it, and you will understand why identity is uh, interesting. Yeah. The project we have with the team in one or two vintage to start to do some in some vineyards. We won't be able to do it everywhere as our way of uh, taking care of the vine takes a lot of time. If we do high density everywhere, I don't know how many we will need to be after in the summer in the vineyard. We need to be 50, 60. So after you need to, f we need to find a certain balance. What does the, how, how does the high density, what does it give to the wine? Do you think? Uh, they have competition. So they, uh, they need to go further in the soil. And the report of a guy who worked at Lamy shows that a vine in high density close to 17,000, when it's uh, seven, eight years old, gives grape in analysis with the quality of a 30, 35 years old vine. So you win 30 years like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cheap, so cheap crop, in a way. <laughs> yeah, and you have less crop per vine. So it's what we do now. Uh, to have only a few branches per vine, the vine still have the same strength, but it puts it, its strength in less uh, branches. But then you multiply the number of vines, so you have more nice, nicely concentrated branches. So you have a good crop with the concentration of a very small crop like what we do. Yeah. More manual work of pruning and working the soil and everything as well. I want to ask you two related questions. What makes a great Burgundy wine? And what makes a, a wine that has, that can age for many years? What gives a wine longevity, do you think? It's really good questions. And I think we, we will all have different answers to that. Um, because it's a matter of personal taste. For me, a great Burgundy wine is a wine that doesn't, when you drink it, uh, it's not about the producer. You don't say, ah, I recognize this style. It's more something which becomes pleasurable and uh, contemplative. It's where for me, you, you have the quintessence of uh, a Burgundy wine. We don't talk about the rank of appellation. You can have that with a straight Bourgogne Rouge or, or Blanc, if you really do the job. Uh, it's about pure pleasure, pleasure and emotion. For me, wine is supposed to be a, an emotional machine. It's, it has to give you pleasure. We don't drink wine or Burgundy wine because we need to, or you have a big means. Yeah. If you can, uh, you can allow yourself that you have really big means. You drink this kind of wine when you want to do you a favor, a pleasure. So a burgundy wine should give you pleasure, which is, yeah. to, for me, I would become controversial, but it's happening too, too rarely in the, those days. There are too many high-priced wine, which are really well-made. Uh, they have no defaults, but do they give you pleasure when you consume them? And I think is a wine, if a wine is balanced from the beginning, from the grape, it can last whenever. Do you think then, from what you were saying, that the pleasure comes, for some people, the pleasure comes from the idea of drinking something that's very expensive or very rare, rather than what the wine actually tastes like? Do you think that's true? Uh, it's true. That's just people who it's interesting to, to blind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's certainly with Burgundy. That's why I said it's a, a question which it's very, which is very personal. It because it it's because it depends. We don't all drink for the same reason, for the same purpose. So we don't, and we have all different backgrounds in our life. So you don't 
look for the same thing when you consume wine? Oh, it's really hard to answer that question this way in the general way. So I answer it for my personal taste. Yeah, yeah. And if you could have, you were talking about like the kind of the emotion of drinking a bottle of wine. What bottle has given you the most emotion to drink? Or your own or somebody, another domain? Or? The first bottle who gave, you, gave me so much emotion was a Savigny Lénard Banton. 2006 from Loire. That's why we started to move in the vineyard. It's because of this wine. I, I wondered how a wine can give me so much sensation and emotions. It's not possible. So, did you ask? Uh, did you ask Lalu? Sorry. Did you ask Lalu? How did you make this? No, but um, I told her. And now my aim is. I hope that someday the wine we craft at the domain uh, could give one people or some people. The same emotions. There yeah. we will start to to achieve what we look for. This is my aim. It's I hope someday some people will get back to me with the same things I had with this one. It would be like now I work for that. Yeah, I think that's something that's very true from my experience. I mean, I've I've been lucky enough to drink a, a, a few of uh, Lalu's wines, and the ones that always are in my memory are not the the really the Grand Cruz, but like uh, Bourgon Aligote. Yeah, Aligote think, <laughs> how how can that be so good? Or some of her, you know, uh, I forget if we Dauvin with the her Merceaux and so on. And I think maybe would you agree, like when I think of the how good a winemaker is, I look at their Bourgogne Rouge or their village, not their Chambertin or their Remy Saint Vivant. It's our window shop. Sorry? That's why it's our window shop. Yeah. yeah. That's why uh, we do the exact same work in all the vineyards. Uh, because, for example, now we have a good publicity uh, worldwide for wines. The people will try with a Bourgogne, not with a Regnaud. Uh, so we need to put the exact same care or even more in those humble wines. Because they, it's harder to succeed into making a good wine in the most humble appellation. Yeah. It's easy to make a good Grand Cru. It's not easy to make a good Bourgogne Rouge. Yeah. Or... Yeah. So is it important, I guess, from that, you need to put as much care into your, let's say, cheaper wines or wines from the lower classifications as your as your Grand Cruz, for example. Working in the vineyard and the, in the cellar, we don't make any difference between any vineyard or any appellation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Only a great example of that is uh, what does Emmanuel Renault in the south of France? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you are in a very parting festive way. You open a pignon of Fonsalet or Arias, but you can have daily drinking with a Domaine des Tours, which costs eight years the bottle, and the wine is as fantastic as the great, the big ones, the big yeah. ones. This is what, for me, they are the two greatest growers of France is her, Madame, and this guy. Because you can take the most humble appellation. We don't talk about the price tag if we say about Lalu. I know it's a matter for a lot of people, but for me as a viticulture, if you, we speak about technique, you can bring a very simple app and humble appellation to this level. Yeah. So after it's what can you do with the top wine? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, actually, unfortunately, we've we've run out of time. We've sort of hit our hour mark. But Charles, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you. Uh, really, really interesting, and uh, I'm looking forward now even more to coming down and hope hopefully seeing seeing you again later this year, depending on uh, how everything goes. And uh, but yes. uh, thank you very much for joining us and. Um, I look forward to drinking your wine in the future. So thank you very much, Charles. Thank you, everybody, for listening and uh, 